Hey humans, so some more new AI shizzle or new features have been released. And for those of you who follow my work and watch these videos and read my newsletter, you will know I'm a huge fan of Notebook LM by Google. And recently, not being content with just having audio overviews, they've now released the capability to have video overviews as well. I've been really interested to find out, are these any good? Are they just gonna be a bit gimmicky? So today we're going to do that. We're going to jump into the slightly updated UI on Notebook LM. We're going to look at how you can create a video overview. And I'm also going to give you an example of the finished video overview from the notebook that I share. So remember to stay till the end for that. Let's get cracking. Okay, so we're looking at one of my notebooks that I have been working on for nearly two years now. A lot of people don't actually realize Notebook LM has been out a lot longer than most people think in different iterations. And I think I've been using it since the beta or beta, however you say that. So look, the notebook on your screen is basically where I've been focusing on building a library of information on gen AI skills, how we can build them, what the research is around this. Now, in the slightly updated version of Studio, you will now see on the right-hand side here that these Areas have been consolidated into creating your audio overview, creating a mind map video overview, and then reports here as well. So your briefing docs, study guides, et cetera, et cetera, all live there. Now to create a video review, all you have to do is click this button. I am not gonna do that because I've already done it. You can also see as well that you can customize the video review before you create it. So do do that because I did not do that on the example I'm about to show you. So. That's a new revelation for me there too. So use that to get really specific on what you want your video to focus on, just like you can do in the audio overview as well. And I've got a separate video showing best practice for audio overview if you wanna check that out. So what you need to do is click video overview. And then what will happen is when that's done is you will get this video overview here. You can rename it, you can download it, you can share it. That can take some time, I must say. So when I did do this originally, it took about 20 minutes that's pretty fast in the grand scheme of things when you consider what it is creating. So we can click into that and then we will get the video preview that will come up here. So you can see this is about seven minutes long and it's based on all of the sources that I've got. In a few moments, you'll be able to watch that video so you can decide for yourself how good it is. My initial kind of reaction is it's interesting. I think there's more to be developed there, which is always great. One of the things that I didn't like was that it kind of jumped between sources and the connections didn't make sense from time to time. I get this is really new, so I expect that, but it could be a little confusing because it kind of just cherry picked different parts of the sources. And it's only because I've used them so much that I remember them. But if I was to share this with someone who'd never seen any of those sources or read those sources before, it could be a little bit confusing and maybe misleading. What I did like though, is that it did keep my attention and it did pull out, in my opinion, stuff that was quite relative to the topic in this notebook. And it did explain it in a structured way. So I think there's some great positives there, a bit to work on. But overall, look, as we continue to save all this technology, pretty impressive. I'm not going to call it game changing. A lot of stuff is not game changing, as people know I say all the time. But I think it's good and it's moving in the right direction. So my rating right now would be in the middle. Give it a try, play around with it, but just be aware there are limitations like all things. So we'll leave it there for today. As always, if you found this helpful, do click the like button because it really does help me in terms of getting noticed on the crazy algorithmic platform that is YouTube. And of course, drop me a comment. Let me know if you've used this, share your videos as well. And I'll talk to you in the next one, but keep tuned to this video because you will see this example of my video following this. Ciao. Welcome to the explainer. You know, we've all heard the hype. Generative AI is here to make us more productive. But what really happens when we give everyday knowledge workers actual AI powered superpowers? I mean, when we let them tackle jobs they were never ever trained to do. Okay, let's dive in. The Boston Consulting Group's Henderson Institute really nailed it with this quote. See, we're not just talking about another tool here we're talking about a whole new type of employee. This is a fundamental shift in the workforce. 
and it's all being driven by something researchers are starting to call the exoskeleton effect. So what on earth is this effect? Well, it's the idea that AI is way more than just a faster typewriter or a smarter calculator. Think of it like something you strap on your existing abilities, something that expands what you're capable of in totally new directions. Now, notice the keywords here, new skills. This isn't about doing your old job just, you know, 10% faster. Researchers from BCG and OpenAI see this as the power to attempt and actually succeed at tasks you literally couldn't do before. It's like an instant upgrade to your professional skill set. Okay, that sounds pretty incredible, but is it for real? Well, researchers put this whole theory to the test in a pretty groundbreaking experiment. They took hundreds of management consultants. These are smart people for sure, but they're not data scientists. And they asked them to perform some seriously complex data science tasks, like coding in Python and building predictive models. The results were, well, they were staggering. This chart shows you how they did compared to expert data scientists who are the benchmark right there at zero. The control group, the folks with no AI, they struggled big time, scoring 63 percentage points below the experts. But the group using AI, they were only 14 points below. They practically closed the entire skill gap just like that, instantly. And let's just zoom in on that coding task for a second. The AI augmented group performed a whopping 49% better than their peers. Just think about what that means. You've got participants who had never written a single line of code in their lives, and suddenly they're performing at 84% of the level of a professional data scientist. It's not an exaggeration to say this is like putting on an Iron Man suit for knowledge work. So hey, case closed, right? Gen AI instantly reskills the entire workforce. Problem solved. Well, not so fast. Because the researchers noticed a hidden catch. A twist in the story that kind of changes everything. This is the question on everyone's mind. I mean, if you can perform the task of a data scientist, you must be learning to be one, right? It just seems logical. But what happens when you take the AI away? And this is where the story takes a sharp turn. After the experiment was over, the researchers tested everyone's knowledge without the help of AI. The result, absolutely zero improvement. The group that used AI did no better on the technical questions than the group that never touched it at all. The superpower, it turns out, was borrowed. It wasn't learned. And this is the crucial takeaway. That capability boost is temporary. It's completely dependent on having the tool. It's like using the exoskeleton isn't the same as actually building the muscle yourself. Doing something with AI and truly learning to do it are two very, very different things. Okay, so that's the exoskeleton story. It's all about individual performance, but with a pretty serious catch. But let's be real. Work is rarely a solo sport. So what happens when you drop this technology into a team environment? Well, a totally separate study from Harvard Business School and Procter & Gamble decided to find out. Their research came up with a completely different metaphor. This wasn't an exoskeleton for one person, but a cybernetic teammate. The idea here is that AI isn't just a tool you use, it can actually act like a partner you work with, filling in the roles a human teammate normally would. And the results were fascinating. The study found that a single person using AI could produce work at the same quality level as a two-person human team. It also helped bridge that classic, often painful, divide between the technical R&D folks and the commercial specialists. And get this, people actually felt better working with AI. They reported more excitement and less of the frustration that, let's be honest, can sometimes come with human collaboration. So now we've got these two really powerful ideas on the table, the exoskeleton and the cybernetic teammate. Plus, we've got this major risk, not actually learning anything. So how do we make sense of it all? Luckily, researchers in educational psychology have developed this brilliant framework called the ISAR model. The ISAR model gives us four distinct ways to think about AI's impact. First, you've got inversion. That's the negative one, where AI actually gets in the way of learning. Then there's substitution, where AI just replaces a human process. Then augmentation, where it boosts our skills. And finally, redefinition where it creates totally new ways of working we haven't even thought of yet. So now we can start to map what we've learned onto this framework. The exoskeleton effect, giving consultants those coding superpowers? Yeah, that's a perfect example of augmentation. The AI enhanced their capabilities, letting them perform new and difficult tasks. And the cybernetic teammate effect, where that one AI-powered person performs like a two-person team? That's a classic case of substitution, the AI provided an equivalent alternative to having a human collaborator right there with you. And that hidden catch, the fact that nobody actually retained any new knowledge, that is the risk of inversion. 
over-relying on the tool undermined the chance for real, deep learning. This shows us that all of these effects, augmentation, substitution, and yes, even inversion, can all be happening at the very same time. You see, understanding this framework is absolutely the key to managing this massive transition to an AI augmented future. So what are the big takeaways? For leaders and for all of us as learners, what should we do next? Well, the BCG research lays out five really core implications. First, leaders can now hire from a much, much wider talent pool. But, and this is a big but, they have to deliberately protect time for real learning, not just AI-assisted performance. Teams also need to be redesigned with expert oversight, and the whole focus of workforce planning needs to shift away from narrow skills like coding toward broader mindsets like adaptability. Which brings us to one last, really surprising finding from the study. It turns out that workers who had even a little bit of coding experience performed better across all the tasks, even the non-coding ones. It wasn't the specific skill that mattered, it was the engineering mindset that coding helps you develop that ability to break a big, messy problem down into small, logical steps. That mindset might just be the true superpower. And all of this leaves us with a final, absolutely critical question. In a world where AI can provide the what to do and even the how to do it, what is the new role for human expertise? What's left for us?